Thanks, Graham. Um, Rightio, most of what I've said has been said by Dorian, and uh, so uh, don't worry about that, but uh, I'll just pitch it differently, hopefully make it a bit more simple, but uh, <laughs> far less comprehensive. <laughs> and I can promise you I won't do it as well. But anyway, breeding your cows for genetic gain. So uh, I guess uh, there's one thing, and it and um, should be the objective of all studs and of all seed stock herds, and that's improvement. If we're not getting better, then what are we doing? We're just producing the same thing every year. And uh, that's all part of uh, the excitement of stud breeding, the excitement of uh, seed stock and producing the next best thing. And, it, and it, it absolutely must be at the core of all objectives. And so improvement occurs when your, the side team you choose are of higher merit than the cows in your herd. And ultimately you produce better calves because we want the calves we're breeding to be better than their parents. And so that should always be the, the, the objective. And genetic improvement is quite different to genetic change. So we can change uh, animals and cattle all we like, but unless we improve them, then it really doesn't have much of a point. Genetic improvement. Rightio, real basic one. I think probably you've seen this slide before, but um, these three chooks over the last 50-odd uh, years, and they've been, they are in the same constitute uh, ration diet, and for the same length of time, under the same opportunity conditions, and we've got quite a difference in the way they look and the way they perform now. So genetic gain or improvement works, and it's effective, and if you want to do it, you can capture that, that benefit. So some of the things that affect it, primarily is heritability. So um, it's really heritability shows how much of what we see is genetic. So uh, how much is passed on to the next generation or um, how much a calf is like its parents. So that's, that's my simple way to um, talk about heritability and see that child has inherited half of his mother and half of his father. If it's not heritable, you can't select for it. So if, if it's not able to be passed on with the genes, then uh, we can't breed for it. And uh, we express it and as a percentage or zero to one. So that's part of it. But the most important thing is this phenotype um, and its influence of genotype and environment and how that influences what we see. Phenotype is what we see in front of us, it's a trait, what we see visually. So um, we have a trait that's low heritability, so not much of uh, what we see is, is a result of its genes, uh, then the environment has a big part um, of an influence in the way it looks. So that's why the E is real big in that picture. But of course when it's high heritability, the G is big. So the, uh, what we see is as, as a result of its genes. And so they are the traits that uh, we need less information for and we can, um, we can breed for more quickly. We can change or improve. Right, so um, this next thing here is the bell curve. And it's, this, is the, this is the, should be the, um, the, the easy uh, way to interpret um, improvement. So on this left axis, on the up and down one, you've got number of animals, and on the bottom, you've got merit. So as that curve gets steeper, we get more animals. And as, uh, as we go along the curve towards the right, we improve in merit. So, as you can see, most of these animals are around the average, they're around the middle. So when Doreen says we shrink it and we don't have much information, we assume they're all fairly similar. But we need more information to discriminate or say otherwise. So, as you can see, these, animal, these actually bugger all animals at the bottom end and at the top end, and those tails, most around the middle. So our uh, intention in breeding is to shift the average. So we won't shift the range, um, and this, this little graphic doesn't do a great job of showing that, but we don't shift the range too much, but we do intend to shift the average, shift the mean of those bell curves, making genetic improvement. And there's a few things that influence genetic improvement. And uh, we can uh, measure this uh, using the breeder's equation, which shows the response to selection. So if we choose different animals, this is, this is what happens. Um, and this is the potential improvement we can make. So these are four factors there, and we're going to go through them. And it should be, everyone after this and in the future should be able to quote this, because it's actually, it should be the fundamental of any breeding program, the basics. Rightio, selection intensity. I've just said it here, it's how good the parents are. So choose the best ones. It shows you uh, how good the, the merit of the parents you choose are for the next generation. So we always want to choose the best parents. So in the bell curve, I've got this little red bit here of, of Mark with a pen. They're the animals we pre prefer to choose. Those the size as the parents of the next generation. If we want to be getting good selection intensity. 
So, choose them intensely. Pick them well, get the top end. Then we have accuracy. So, accuracy is a difference between what we think an animal will do and its true merit. So, we could say we could just about get to its true merit, but it's going to take you a fair while. It's going to take you lots of progeny and lots of time. So, accuracy is great because... Once we've got a breeding value that's highly informed, there's lots of information contributing towards that, there's lots of progeny, that's all good, but it takes ages. And, um, and, and it's obviously a fundamental of, of any breeding program. Intensity times accuracy times variation divided by generation interval. But um, another thing there is that uh, you can still have gain with low accuracy. So you can have an EBV that's at 30% accuracy, but you can still use it to select for fairly confidently. Even if it's low, you can make lots of improvement. So we can choose yearling bulls, and they not, don't have a lot of information contributing towards their EBVs, but we can, we can rocket our breeding programs along. But there's, a, there's always a trade-off, and uh, those EBVs are going to fluctuate. They're going to move with more information. So it's a balance. Variation. So variation is just how different your population is, really, how diverse it is. And so extreme ends of the scale, if you've, you've got very little variation, you get in, inbreeding depression, and that's just a result because lots of our genes are very similar and we, we put them together and those combinations, if there's some bad stuff in there, um, stuff comes out. And, uh, and, but if we've got uh, very different genes on the other end of the scale, we get uh, almost the opposite hybrid vigour. So we actually get extra benefit from those genes and those combinations being very different. So one idea is to use heaps of size so you get lots of variation. And, um, but if you're going to use heaps and heaps of bulls, you're going to find that... Uh, and those calves out in the paddock, they're going to be up and down, aren't they? So uh, there's a trade-off with consistency. But intensity times accuracy times variation divided by generation interval. And so if we've got a, if we've got a narrow uh, bell curve, it's, nice, it's quite tight. We haven't got much variation. And if it's a wide bell curve, we've got lots of variation. So we've got lots of different animals to choose from. Generation interval. So this is I've described as the average age of your herd. The average age of the herd, that's going to be parents. So, like, not your calves, but, but you know, your mothers and your, and your sires. So, um, the ultimate way to, to ramp up generation interval, to choose your youngest animals, would be yearling bulls over yearling heifers. And it's quite an easy uh, combination to use. Um, and it, so, it's that choosing do we use a young bull that is, uh, is going to accelerate a generation interval, or do we use an old bull who's highly accurate? So, there's some antagonisms in the in, the, in, in selection, and it's about balancing that equation, getting all those different factors in balance, because when we ramp up one, we often lose another one. So one of the um, antagonisms is, uh, is intensity, so you want to choose the highest parents, you know, the highest quality parents of merit, right at the top end of the bell curve, but um, you also want to uh, get plenty of variation, and it tends to be your best bulls are out of your best cows, by your best size, and so you naturally go towards reducing your variation. So they, there's an antagonism there. Best parents are often related. The other one is accuracy and generation interval. So like you want to choose um, bulls that are highly accurate, all good, but it takes ages to get bulls that are highly accurate. So young bulls, not a lot of information, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. And, and, and of course, generation interval and, uh, and selection intensity, um, we want to we want to reduce the age of, of, of the herd. Um, and we tend to, as a result, um, uh, we lose uh, choosing the best, bit of parents. So we want to balance that. And I had this pretty, um, pretty flash teacher who's a sheep guy in Aussie, Julius van der Werf, and he reckoned that if the relative factors of genetic change can be achieved in balance, then there's no end to what we can do. So if we can balance them all, ramp it up, we'll get there. And we can do it forever. So you want to ramp up your gain? These are some of the tools you can use, some of the methods you can do to ramp up your gain in your program. So the first one is get a breeding objective. If you don't know where you're going, then how are you going to get there? So you're going to have a goal. You're going to have an objective and uh, work out what the traits are that are important to you and important to your clients as, as breeders. And then just record what's important to that, to that objective. And, um, and if there's lots of traits that you're choosing, it's, uh, it's, you, often, um, you often can't go as fast because you've got too many factors there that are going to, uh, too many traits that so are going to slow you down. So... If you really wanted to ramp it up, you just choose one trait. Well, I guess you'd lose everything else, wouldn't you? So index selection is quite an easy way to do that. Put some dollar terms, and it bounces all that that trade off between different traits. You want to ramp up your gain? Do you do this? You, you want to spread your good genes? You want to improve 
uh, your selection density, make the good parents spreaders of more genes than others. So do a flush, it's a memory transplanting, or transfer, sorry, or, or, or some AI. So uh, get the top parents, spread them out. But of course, um, there's a trade-off in price, and there's a trade-off with, um, with variation. But um, just got to keep it in balance. And um, this is the really important one here, is that make sure your EBVs are solid. You want to improve your, ac your accuracy, make sure your EBVs are reflective of what they're actually passing on. So record, record the hell out of your herd, and because uh, there's just such an absence of it. I've heard there are 50% of people ultrasound scanning from Dorian's talk. Um, most people aren't getting a final weight beyond yielding. So there's, um, there's, a real, there's a real loss, a drop out of information. We can correlate traits, all good, you get a birth weight, sweet, and then we'll, we can work out how, how fast they're going to grow, but um, are we happy with that? So uh, do DNA parentage. Make sure you know who the sires are, because if you've got a wrong sire, and they're uh, passing on their genes to your, to your, to your um, herd, and they um, actually turn out to be the wrong bull, well, then your EBVs don't stand for bugger all. So watch that. Uh, use your EID tags. We've got, all got EID tags in, but no one's really using them. I just think that's ridiculous. They're easy if you've got a recording, uh, a recording capture. Get XR5000 or a Gallagher TSI. Great bits of kit. And that's a bit daunting to begin with. You think, oh, it's a bit hard to use. Um, but... Uh, it's actually so simple once you once you get a get a handle on it. It's a lot easier than buddy um, brass tags and and um, and bits of paper. So um, yeah, and uh, and get a herd recording software. Once you've captured all that information, use it. Get it up on the screen. It's all in the same place, and then you can just go bang, flick it out, and you can go straight into breed plan. A couple of great options on the market at the moment. And then use genomics. So if you want to improve the accuracy of your EBVs, and genomics are available to you. They improve your accuracy, they improve your traits, um, because they are better reflections of their true merit. Right, this is just two, this is two uh, herds, and I don't know who these two herds are, Charles given them to me today, and uh, they took those two herds at, at the same time obviously made very different decisions on that 2010. One decided they wanted to be a, a gold star complete herd, recording as many traits as they can, full contemporary groups and doing lots of the good stuff, and the other one decided they didn't want to. And, um, and I guess as a result, one probably chose bulls of higher merit, but they uh, showed two quite different trends. Right, ramping up your gain, look at, always choose your best bulls. Density, choose right at that top part of the curve. And, um, and because at the end of the day, your biggest opportunity to make gain is by choosing the right bull, because they are responsible for 80% of the genes in your heifer crop. And, uh, and if you want to, if you want to choose, uh, balance off that intensity, of course, with, um, with variation, use more size, benchmark them. Um, you want to keep ramming up your gain, consider your heifers and, and your selection there. Um, mate as many as you can that are sound and, and, and are up to weight, uh, and, and probably let nature do the, do the rest. Um, because there's, there's all these, um, these issues, you want to get reduced um, your generation interval, so naturally, you're knocking off those cows at the top end. Um, as a result, you need more heifer replacements, like Dorian said. So if you, if you can make more of them, and rather than just choose your biggest, fattest heifers out of your oldest cows that are born the earliest, try and use the ones with the high merit. And genomics can help you with that. Um, and the other one is cow selection. So um, cows obviously represent 20% of the gain you heard, um, but... Um, it's actually, you don't make as much progress if you just decide to really, you know, you're culling your cows hard, and that's important. You want to remove your, your poorer performing cows. Your cows aren't sound and aren't doing it, aren't getting a calf. But if you want to make more gain, you use a sire. You, and you use, on the sire's dam side, you reflect him in a good, in a good dam because he's, of, of course, 50% of the genes. But, um, yeah, the, the most effective way is to is just choose a sire. But um, so there was a Jeff Nickel um, article a while ago, and, and it said that, um, by choosing your um, your twinning uh, hoggets every year or your twinning females, you only really have an opportunity of about two to five percent of additional reproductive gain over their lifetime. So you can keep choosing your highly fertile your twinners or whatever in a, in a, in a flock, but um, it's not going to do a heck of a lot for the overall picture. Choose a sire. Another one here is this paint by numbers option, uh, mate cell, uh, which is uh, distributed by breed plan and. Uh, and it actually helps you balance up these uh, different opportunities for matings. So it gives you the best combinations, reduces your inbreeding um, depression or potential for that, 
and uh, you can get your best combination in, in every mating, and that's called mate cell. So get a breeding objective, know where you're going, and balance those different factors of the equation, intensity times accuracy times variation divided by generation interval, and uh, use the tools to get there. Oh, this is another one, very similar. Uh, a breeder from the wire wrapper, and he just like Julius van der Verf said, there's no end to the, anything. There is no end to the improvement of anything biological. It may slow down, but it will go on. So uh, keep improving. And we'll get there. Yes, Bex, I have a question for you. Um, so when, when a commercial breeder goes to a sale, they like to see an even line of bulls. And one of your, um, one of the top line of the, um, the numerators is variation, so you want maximum variation. And, and that is an, a bit of a conflict in terms of trying to put an even line of bulls together. So how do we change the message for the commercial client? Or, or how do you solve that equation? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, so like you use index, you use index selection, but always choose a similar type of bull in your, in, in your breeding program. So like confirmation type, every year you want to be choosing similar types, but they've got different, they've got different ranges of performance. That would be my, um, my answer to you. <laughs> 